going to take a little bit of time, not a long time, but a little bit of time since they took all my time. <laughs> well, <clears throat> it's really not my time, but uh, it's really the Holy Ghost, and there's some things he wants to say. So before we leave, we're still going to address our hearts, and we're still going to allow God to do some things in our hearts where there's been disappointment or that where our heart has been, uh, as Maureen said, infected, amen? Uh, we're going to talk about that. And we're, but before we do, we're going to continue talking a little bit about reconciling people to God. We talked about that last week. We began a series. We began to talk about reconciling people to God, okay? We told a little story about creation and we said God created everything God created the man God created the woman but in the middle of the creation we said it was just a little little just an illustration we said there was a huge box right in the middle of everything God did and the box was supposed to stay closed forever however Adam and Eve opened the box and when they opened the box, there was an explosion. And it was as if a bunch of black ink w was in the box. And the moment it was opened, that ink exploded over the human race that would come all the way into the future of all time. That moment, in all of the human race that would ever be, found themselves with spots of black ink all over them. Now, some of us had a big spot, and some of us had some littler spots, but we all had spots. We all had spots, and so Father looked at the human race, and he saw all the spots on everybody, and he said, you know, these spots are keeping people from having a relationship with me because it makes them feel so dirty and guilty and shamed and condemned and so he decided he would send his son and his son came to wipe the spots off and, and the spots aren't just sin the spots could be anything that keeps us from enjoying an amazing relationship and a wonderfully blessed life with God a spot could be fear a spot could be anxiety a spot could be bitterness a spot could be pornography a spot could be sickness it could be disease it could be depression it could be so many so many different things and Jesus came and he came to wipe those spots off of people and to help them be reconciled to God. That's why when people were, were deathly sick and dying, he, he, he said, come on here, I'm going to help get that spot off of you, and he ministered healing. And when people felt dirty and condemned because they had fallen into a lifestyle that hurt them and hurt so many other people, he said, I'm not here to condemn you. And he wiped that spot off. And for the first time, that person realized that somebody believes in them. Somebody cares about them. But, but when Jesus left, when Jesus left, you were commissioned to come. You were sent by God. You were given a ministry of reconciliation. You and I are here instead of Christ. And the reason you're here is not to evaluate the spots that somebody has, but it's to wipe them off. It's to figure out how to help that person and how to get those spots off of them. And how to create a culture where they won't feel embarrassed or ashamed to come and say to you, I got some spots, can you help me? And not to look at my spots as if they're worse than your spots. Did you ever notice that some spots we think are really bad spots? And other spots, they're okay spots. Usually the okay spots are the ones that you have. The, 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 the really bad ones are the ones that other people have. But they're all spots. And you're here instead of Christ to help people get those spots off. 
And we were talking about how we were given authority. And we were given dominion to release words. Not just to release words, but to resist darkness. And how through releasing words and how through binding demon powers and how through resisting darkness, we could actually help remove spots off of other people. Today I want to talk about pictures because I believe pictures mean power. And remember, we're talking about removing spots and you think, well, you know, I got a pretty good kid, but I wonder why it is that, that, that like, like, did you ever notice sometimes, sometimes people, they even come to church and they got spots where they can't even lift their hands. God is good and he loves people and he cares about people and he helps people and he heals people. What is it? What is it that causes us to continue doing the same thing again and 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 again? Not be able to lift our hands and worship him and shout and praise and dance. It's just spots. It's just spots. So I want to talk about pictures. Pictures mean power. Pictures mean power. That's what God said to Abraham. He said, Abram, I'm going to teach you that pictures mean power. Pictures mean power. God came and he met Abram. He met him personally. He met him in all his power. He was talking with him and he said, what do you want from me? What do you want me to do for you? And Abram said, I want a baby. I'm 75 years old and I don't have a son. I don't have an heir to my household. And, and I, I would love to have a son, but we've tried for all these years and we haven't been able to have a son. And I'd like to have a son, but I need a miracle. I know we need a miracle if we're going to have a son. God, can you do this miracle for us? And God said, I'll do it. I'll do it for you. I'll do it for you because that's what I do for people. And then he gave him a promise. He, he didn't give him a miracle. He gave him a promise. Do you understand that the miracle was in the promise like the apple tree is in the apple seed? And he gave him a promise, and from that time on, God would work with Abram to teach him the purpose of the promise and how to work with the promise to extract the miracle out of it. And what he said to him is he said this in Genesis 5, 15 and 5. He, he said to Abram, he, he came and met him in the evening at night when it was dark out. He called him out of his tent and he said to him, he said, Abram, come here, come here. I want you to look up at the skies. And he brought Abram forth in Genesis 15 and 5. And he brought him forth abroad and said, look now toward heaven, Abram. And I want you to tell the stars, you can underline that, he wanted him to talk to the stars. Pretty good, huh? If you ever see me talking to a tree, just, just think I'm like Abram, I'm not crazy. He told him to talk to the stars, and then he said, if you be able to number them, and he said unto him, so shall thy seed be. The promise that he gave Abram was this, so shall thy seed be. It could have been Abraham chapter 1 and verse 1, it, 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 so shall thy seed be. That was the promise. And he said, Abram, I want you to take the promise. I want you to look up to heaven. And I want you to see the stars. I want you to get a picture in your mind. I want you to get a picture in your heart as you count the stars, count one star and say to that star, so shall my seed be. Count the next star and say, so shall my seed be. I want you to get a picture on the inside of you. I want you to use your imagination. I want you to use your mind. And I want you to get a picture on the inside of you of having something that you don't have yet. 
And I want that picture to become so big and so real inside your heart that it becomes more real to you than what you have, which is no baby right now. Right? How many stars do you think there are? Do you think that signifies God saying, you're going to be doing a whole lot of talking, friend? You're going to be talking the promise. You're not going to be talking about what you have. You're going to be talking about what I said I've given you. And I'm going to teach you how to extract out of this promise my glory, my power, my miracle. I'm going to teach you how to do that because there's a generation coming that sits here today that's been given thousands and thousands of promises. And I'm going to tell them to follow after the faith of Abraham. Do what he did. And the sky will be the limits. They can go anywhere and do anything. Because they're going to have promise after promise after promise after promise. But they're going to have to learn that the power, the power that's in the promise can be brought out with a picture being developed on the inside of them. And if that wasn't enough, Abraham began to say, so shall my seed be, so shall my seed be. So, and he began to develop a picture where he saw children, not one, not two, not ten, but a thousand and ten thousand and a hundred thousand and two hundred thousand. And he began to see him running around in the field in front of him, in the desert in front of him. And he began to see him playing and he was developing the picture on the inside of him. And then it dawned on me. Abraham didn't need a miracle. Sarah did. Because Abraham had produced Ishmael. Sarah needed a miracle, but God went to Abram and taught him. How to use his imagination to develop pictures because he wanted you to understand thousands of years later that your imagination is a way that you release your authority and dominion to help other people, not just you. That you could begin inside of your own mind and your own imagination to see things that God has promised over other people and develop that imagination and it would release dominion and power into their life to assist them. That we didn't any longer just have to look at people struggling day after day with vices and addiction and depression and mental distress and problems, but we could actually begin to take a stand and begin to see them the way God said they are. Begin to take the promises of God and begin to develop those promises believing that a life force of God's power would be emanating out of me and that power would begin to affect their lives through that picture. Now I believe that. That's one of the reasons this building sits here today. Not just me, but many of us, but my part was the picture. You see, I saw this building years before it ever went up. And by the time it was up and everyone was shouting, I was like, move on down the road. Because I lived with the picture in me, and it was more real. And then I began to see a picture inside of me and I developed a picture where there was a long line of cars trying to get in and a long line of cars trying to get out. And then I looked one day and there was a long line of cars. But you can do this with people. You remember in Genesis 11 with the Tower of Babel? You remember when God said, I've got to get down there and confound their languages because they're all of one accord. They're all of one mind. And anything they imagine will not be constrained or restrained from them. 
He was simply trying to say that your imagination is a vehicle that God has provided for which dominion and power is released through. And so when we allow our imaginations to begin to be bitter and hateful and angry and mad, it's not only affecting you, but it's affecting the people. It's projecting a force of power out to them that's affecting their life. You remember when the 12 spies went in to spy out the land? And 10 came back and said, we can't do it. We can't do it. There's giants in the land. These guys are strong. They're mighty. They're brutal. And they're going to squash us like a bug. That's what they said. And two of them said, listen, we're well able to go up and deal with these giants. We'll walk right in there and we'll crush them. We'll beat them. We'll destroy them. And then the Bible went on and said, because they were grasshoppers in their own sight, because of the imagination that was in their own hearts and minds, that picture projected out of them and communicated to the giants, and so were they in the eyes of the giants. Do you understand that? What you sow, the force that comes out of your imagination is what you reap. That's why it's so critical and that's why the Scriptures tells us in 2 Corinthians 10 that the weapons of your warfare are not carnal but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds to the bringing captive every thought in every imagination that exalts itself up against the knowledge of God. I think it's an amazing thing that I can use my imagination to help get spots off of people. And they don't even have to know I'm doing it. Isn't that wonderful? You don't have to go up to them and say, man, you got a lot of spots, dude. I mean, dude, you were spotted up like a leopard. How'd you get so messed up? I'm going to pray for you that God will deliver you, brother, from all those demons. Jeez, thanks, man. That's encouraging. They don't have to know what you're doing. They don't have to know what you're doing, do they? <clears throat> Can I ask you where your imagination is? Do you know we've done a pretty good job at controlling our imaginations and gaining dominion over them and keeping them from going in the wrong place, but we haven't employed our imagination and used it to assist getting spots off of people and to work together with God to extract the miracle that's in every promise. We haven't done it. We have kind of lazy, passive minds. Has anybody ever noticed that? We would rather sit down and feed into our minds pictures and shows and TV and stuff, but, but, but we don't employ that imagination. Larry, will you come up again for me? Give Larry a cheer, somebody. Rick, get Larry a cheer. Just sit right there, Larry. I was going to put my pulpit down. Can I put my pulpit down, Chad? Am I allowed? I know I can, but the question is, can they see me? The question is, can they see me on, yeah, face me, Larry. Don't face them. I'm talking. <laughs> so the reason that I have Larry here is because uh, I, I want to just, I want to show you what, what it's going to take to get the spots off of people and to extract the miracle that's in the promises. You have thousands of promises. Things don't happen automatically. When God came to Abram, he gave him a promise, and then he was teaching Abram how to work together with him. Okay? 
Abram was not trusting in God up there to come down and fix it. The fix was in the promise. Abram was going to trust, God was going to trust Abram to learn how to work with him and cooperate with him so that what was already provided in the promise could be manifested in his life. You got that? But it would require a little bit of work on Abram's part. You say, well, you know, we shouldn't have to work. We're not working to get something from God. We're not working to get right in God's eyes. You've already been made the righteousness of God. We've already been given everything that pertains unto life and godliness. We've already been given all the promises of God. The miracles are already in the promise. The provision is already in the promise. The provision is already in you. It's through these promises and through us cooperating with a simple system that God himself established that you'll begin to extract the benefits of this amazing life. You say, well... Why should I have to cooperate with this system? Well, well, because it's the way it works. I mean, don't you cooperate with the system of gravity? I mean, does anybody just get up in the morning and decide to climb up on the roof of their house and say, I think I'm going to fly to work today? Nobody does that. We don't think that's odd. We don't think that's strange. Whether you're cooperating with the system. Did you understand that? You're cooperating with a simple system that God established. It's called the law of gravity. All matter falls to the lowest point. Well, just like there's simple systems in the natural world, how many of you know that there's systems in the kingdom of God? Like there's a system in the kingdom of America, there's systems in the kingdom of God. You have to learn how to cooperate, and God will teach you. That's why he has given us the Holy Spirit, to teach us how to receive the things that are freely given to you, to teach you how to cooperate with the promises of God, how to work with these promises, how through pictures you tap power. You with me? So I brought Larry up because, see, there was a, a ways back, and, and I was thinking about Larry, and Larry's physical body's been under attack, and there's some other people whose physical body's been under attack. Well, to me, that's a spot. And so I said, how can I help erase the spot? Is there a way provided to erase the spot? And I knew that God provided words, and he provided pictures. And promises. So I began to take the promises and I began to try to create in my mind a dramatic picture, an imagination that would be so real and so powerful and so dynamic that it would take hold of my heart and begin to grow on the inside of there. And in so doing, I believe power would be released to begin to assist Larry. I wouldn't have to be in his presence. I wouldn't even have to tell him this. I hadn't told him for a long time. But I could do something. I'm not here just to live my life. I've been given a ministry of reconciliation. I'm not here just to be blessed. I'm not here just to live my life. I'm not here just to have a nicer place or a better car or a faster car or a fancy motorcycle like Pastor Rick has and Kirk has and all these other guys have. I don't have a motorcycle What was that? Huh? I I wasn't imagining it. Actually, I do imagine myself not having it because I don't want it. It's, It's just too intimidating for me to be on the highway on a motorcycle. I'm going to leave that for the guys that are dreaming of their new Harley. Larry. (laughs) 
But I began to get this picture in my mind of this hot syrup on Larry's head, and, and I just began to see this hot syrup rolling down over his head, over his ears, over his eyes, over his mouth. It went down over his shoulders, and it went down, and it was going down his chest, and I saw it with Tony. I saw it with different people, and then when it got to his chest, I began to, all of a sudden, that syrup turned into like a tornado, like a big funnel, and it was spinning 100 miles an hour, 1,000 miles an hour, and I watched it penetrate straight into his chest. And it went into his lungs, and whenever it went into his lungs, it took a new form on. All of a sudden, it became a robot. And I saw this robot do this, boom, bam, 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 bam. And I saw these honeycombs, and each time the robot would hit this honeycomb and shatter it to a thousand pieces. And then I would hear myself shouting, and I would be in the forest shouting, breathe, Larry, breathe. Breathe, Larry, breathe. Breathe, Larry, breathe. Bam, bam, bam. Because what's attacked him has attacked his lungs, and it's tried to create like a honeycomb. Instead of the air transferring easily, it's like blocked. And there's these thousands and millions of honeycombs, but there's not so many now. There's not so many now because that robot is going bam, bam. Bam, 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 bam. And one by one, they're being shattered. And I hear God shouting, breathe, Larry, breathe. Breathe, Larry, breathe. Breathe, Larry, breathe. Breathe, Larry, breathe. Breathe, Tony, breathe. And I see these pictures inside me. And I wonder what would happen If we really believed, if we were working together in one accord, and we began to take these things, and and, and we would get four people and eight people and six people together, and we would begin to take the promise and begin to work together and begin to help people and begin to picture things. I just lay in bed, and I, I, I just take this picture until I fall asleep. Sometimes it puts me to sleep. Sometimes I just keep going. But I'm telling you, pictures mean power. Every one of us have had the wrong pictures developed in us, and we watched them come to pass. That's what Job's problem was. He had the wrong picture of what was going to happen with his kids, and it happened. Pictures mean power. But you have to make an effort. It doesn't just happen automatically. I have zero creative juices in me, man. I got to work to make a picture. (laughs) You know, there are some creative people and they're just, they flow, you know. I got none of that. But I, I, I can tell you that what Abraham did, did a miracle in Sarah. So what I do, why can't it do a miracle in Larry? Don't you think there are people, don't you think there are people that are stuck? We say, you're just rebellious. Well, we don't say to the sick guy, you're just sick. You sick, sick thing, you. How dare you be sick? We do that to the rebellious guy, but maybe that rebellion just really got a hold of him. Sure, he yielded to it enough times to where it really got a hold of him, but it's got him now and he needs help. 
And we, well, you know, uh, that, that dude's just going to have to go through what he's going to have to go through because he's rebellious and made dumb choices. Wow, thanks, man. I, I'm glad you're on my team. My, I hope I don't start sinking. Wow. I don't know. That's just what God's been talking to me about. Marcus will do it next week. I expected we were going to do that when everything went a different way. I had Marcus coming up to share something, but we're going to do it next week. Today, this is what I want to do. Anybody that has a lung problem, I want you to stand up. I believe there's an anointing that's going to release lungs. It's going to heal lungs. I don't care if it's bronchitis. I don't care if it's, if it's whatever the names are. I don't know names. I'm not good about names, but I want you to know God knows names. I want you to know that God knows. God knows. I believe there's an anointing, a grace available right now. I'm going to ask fire starters to get up and put their hands on anyone that's standing. Any fire starters, I want you to get up. I want you to put your hands on someone that's standing. And we're going to release the glory into their lungs. And you begin to breathe. You begin to do what you couldn't do. This thing is going to be released from you today in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Brother, stand up. Brother, brother, no, brother, with the, look at me. You, yes, you with the tattoo by your eye. You, stand up and put your hands on that brother right there. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Has everybody got someone that got hands on them? Has everybody got hands on them? We're not doing this. I'm telling you the river is rising. I want you to know the waters are rising. We're not settling for just going along in life. We're not settling for people, people being bullied and pushed around and their lives being cut short and sickness and disease crippling them. I want you to know that the rivers are rising and the waters are getting deep. And I want you to know that God can take metal out of your body. God can heal your lungs. God can heal your mind. God can fix your body. I want you to know that God can do anything. We're going to stir ourselves up, church. We're going to stir ourselves up. We're going to begin to expect the impossible. We're going to begin to expect the supernatural. We're not settling for second best. We're not settling for their going to a better place. No, we're not settling for going to a better place. We're settling for God's promise. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we just release right now in the name of Jesus. We release your glory into these lungs and we say, breathe, Larry, breathe. Breathe. Ask the person you got your hands on what their name is and begin to say, breathe, Tino, breathe. Breathe, Larry, breathe. Breathe, Tony, breathe. We loose these lungs in the name of Jesus. We rebuke death from these lungs in the name of Jesus. We say life. Breathe, Chaz. Breathe, Chaz. Breathe. Breathe in the name of Jesus. Breathe in the name of Jesus. Breathe in the name of Jesus. Now you begin to breathe, begin to breathe, begin to take it in, begin to do what you couldn't do. Take in a deep breath. Breathe in the name of Jesus. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Breathe. 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 Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Breathe. Faith is right now. Now faith is. Faith is right now. Right now. Faith is right now. Right now. Breathe. 
Breathe, 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 breathe in the name of Jesus. Breathe in the name of Jesus. Breathe in the name of Jesus. Breathe, Larry, breathe. Breathe in the name of Jesus. 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 All right, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Let's stand up right where we're at, church. Let's lift our hands up. Let's lift our hands up. Let's lift our hands up and let's begin to worship Him. Lift your hands up and say, I love you, Lord. Come on, singers. And I live worship. Go get Marcus. Oh, my soul, rejoice, take joy, my King. I gotta get my Bible. want you just to be seated, please. One, two. I had planned a service for Marcus to come up after I shared just briefly, and he was going to share a thought or two, and then he was going to just release some things that God had shown him. But I told him, well, you're going to wait till next week, because obviously service is going on a little bit. But Pastor Mary came to me and said, I woke up this morning, and I saw Marcus Aurelius at the pulpit. And she said, I, I started looking his name up and all this. And she said, I just think he's supposed to release what God has said. So we're going to go a couple more minutes. And uh, I mean, I, I think it's awesome myself. Uh, so Marcus, go ahead and just follow. Okay. Heart. The reason I'm sitting down is because the anointing of God is on me so strong. I really have never been in this position before. It is just amazing. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim the freedom for the prisoners and to recover the sight of the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. I'm going to say something real bold today. If you're sick, 
If this is you in here, you need to come up here because today the power of God is upon me that I'm going to lay hands on you and you're going to be instantly healed. Now you probably think, well, that's a bold statement. No, it's not because of where I live. You see, I'm a horrible Christian. I suck at it. I really am. I'm the worst Christian you'll ever meet in your life. The reason I'm the worst Christian in the world is because I judge myself by who I am. And I have a real perversion about stupid people. I can't help it. You're stupid, you're stupid. And you can't fix stupid. So you come to me and you're stupid, I'm going to tell you, you're stupid. Now, the trouble with that is it stops me from being a Christian because I judge myself by who I am. And I think a lot of us as Christians, we suffer because of who we are. You know, we don't know how sin works. So I'm going to tell you how sin works. Sin, every sin in the world is exactly the same. Right? When Eve was uh, tempted by the devil, oh, she wasn't tempted by the devil, she was tempted by the snake. We don't see this because of who we are. It's really hard to see who we are when we're who we are. But God didn't call us to be who we are. All right? He did not. I'm defined by what I am. I made the change. To do that, I had to change cultures. And as a guy, that's really hard because I live in boxes. I have my work box. I have my TV box. I have my family box. And the trouble is, I have my favorite box, the remote and the TV box. I can't operate as a mighty man of God under that. I have to change cultures. So what's been happening to me? Let me tell you. I have a friend at work uh, three days before Christmas. He came to me and he was crying. He was saying, my dad's going to die. I said, oh, no, he's not. And I'm going to tell you why, what I shared with him. And this is it. You know, Eve ate of the good side of the tree because it was good. And she was tempted by the snake. She wasn't tempted by Satan. Satan had already told the snake what to do. And the thing is, is that we as Christians, we are good people. You've got to stop doing that. Because if you're good, that means you're under the law. The law doesn't work that way. Grace is not subject to the law. The law is subject to grace. Are you getting this? All right. Now, when you start getting this, I want you to start walking up. If you're crippled or have a a walk, leave that behind. You need to walk up here. All right, I don't want you to do that. If you can't walk, then crawl. All right? If you want it that badly, that's what you're going to need to do. I tried to rehearse this story to yesterday, but I couldn't because people keep coming up to me and I have to lay hands on them to get them healed, praise God. And it's instantaneous. It's amazing. All right? So the thing is, is that we're deceived by sin because we're good people. Well, the snake, the devil didn't touch the, the, the tree of life of good and evil. So as a result, he was not affected. But he was the next in line. So he could take our authority from us. The snake. Who likes snakes? Every time I sneeze one, I run them over. The reason I run them over is because I hate them. All right? You understand where I'm going with this? All right. Now, this is the great part. The bad that Eve was eating of in the goodness wasn't there. But the consequences were all the same. So why was she so misguided? Because for the first time in her life, emotion ruled her. She didn't rule the emotion. We as Christians, we're stuck in our emotions. I can't go lay hands on people because they're sick. Because of what I am. Who I am. I'm... I'm, I get irritated. I get frustrated. People tick me off. But the thing is, I go back to what I am. When I cuss or I make bad decisions, I don't go, Father God, I am the righteousness of God in Christ. I proclaim that. Now, I don't have any power to lay hands on you and you're going to get healed, just so you know that. Praise God. I am free from that. It ain't my word. It's not my word, it's his. Now, I'm going to tell you something about the power of that word. Jesus said, I have exalted my word above my name. Now look, 
You can understand this and that's all well and good and go back to your TV. It's not going to work because you chose to be under bondage. Or you can do something else. You can change cultures. My friend, he came up to me before his dad was going to die. Stage four cancer, wasn't going to make it till Christmas. Two weeks ago, he came up to me. My dad is totally healed. The doctors don't know what's going on. Because I'm empowered with this, I go, during the day, I, I had to work in San Antonio and wait there all day. So I go up to the Walmart at Walsing, on Walsing Road, and I wait for people who were sick, and I jump on them. <laughs> oh, it's awesome. One guy says to me, he said, I can't walk. Don't, don't ever get old, he said. Don't ever get old, he said. I can't stand it. I can't walk anymore. I said, well, you know what? Let me tell you about my friend Jesus. He said, oh, I know about Jesus. I said, no, you don't. You don't possess him like I possess him. When you possess him, you're not worried about whether it's going to work because his word created everything. Let me tell you about the power of grace. Anything that was created outside of creation is illegally here. Your abundance, everything, it was already provided. And so you know it was already provided. He sat down. He rested. Why did he rest? Because it was all done. You know, Jesus was never tempted by the devil. I want you to let you know that. He went looking for him. Because his time was up. You know what? When you all get healed today, what's inside me is looking for you. It's about pictures. I'm identified by my culture. The culture I live in, I am the anointed of God. I am the healed of God. If you want to be an Easter worshiper, oh, that's your reclassification, by the way. You're Easter worshippers. You're not Christians anymore. Oh, you laugh, but the world is doing that to you, and you accept it. Stop it. We're in the last days, and the world is trying to influence what we should think, how we should live, where we should to die. Last week after church, I went downtown. I'm looking for someone. Saw this lovely little couple, and their, their child is autistic, can't speak. I, lay, I let release righteousness in him. Did anything change? No. Did it matter? No. You know why? It's his word, not mine. I'm not afraid. The reason I come up with this bold statement, I'm not afraid. I'm full of the righteousness of God. My wonderful mother-in-law is over there and she'll tell you. This time last week she was in hospital. Got a blockage in her stomach. Oh no, it did not. We went there, laid hands on her, they unplugged her, and we went out and had lunch together, praise God. Stand up, Margie. This is power. This is why I live and breathe. This is awesome. Friday night, I had to go work late, all right? And a tornado came. It came right above our house. It ticked my wife off. She got out there, rebuked it. You know, that thing ran away from her. It even stopped raining, praise God. You know, we have to understand our authority. I'm going to give you an example of authority. We don't know what authority means. We don't. We think, I'm bigger than you, so I have authority over you. No, it doesn't work that way. Authority subjects everything around it. I drive a 5,500-pound bus. I'm driving through the city of Austin. All of a sudden, this policeman comes up, puts his hand out to stop me. I could win that argument. Gravity's on my side. I don't like stupid people. I could hit him. But the trouble is he has authority. It trumps gravity. My wife, bless her heart. Stand up, beautiful. Bless her little heart. She has a job. With that job comes a parking spot. Now, that may not mean anything to you, but it means the world to us. Because she gets to park downtown has her own inside parking. Downtown Austin, she only has to get on the elevator to get to her office. Oh, look how bubbly and fluffy and nice she is. She really is, she's a lovely person. Until you park in her spot. <laughs> Being brothers and sisters, you are full of the righteousness of God. But if you're operating under who you are, you ain't going to get nothing, and the word's not going to work. Grace doesn't work that way. So where does sickness come from? It comes from sin. 
Who, 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 who gave sin? We allow sin to come into this world. Sickness, disease, no matter what it was, its power comes from sin. What's sin subject to? Righteousness. Righteousness. You know, it's not that the name of Jesus is such a great name, because it is. But Jesus never went around healing people by putting oil on them, saying the blood of me, the blood of me. He didn't say any of that stuff. He didn't go to your house with a bottle of Crisco. Hey, there you go. Look, we have got to take authority. It's given to us. But when you're who you are, you will never get anywhere because you have been lied to. You're eating of the goodness of the tree, not understanding that the badness is stealing all your benefits. This world is trying to tell us how to live, breathe, what we should take when things don't work. It's telling us all this stuff. We've got to stop that. I am not an Easter worshiper. I am a mighty man of God. I am bold and I'm anointed. I'm going to take the world by force. But I can't do it who I am. What I am changes that. And it's already given. Now, the biggest trouble with prayers is that we pray down here. Just so you know, they're not going to work. They can't. Because Jesus invited us to stand, sit with him up in heavenly places. That's where we should be praying for. That influence of being with him all the time, the stuff is easy. It's exciting. When you all get healed today, it's going to be amazing. It's powerful. When I came in today, Mary said the anointing's on. I said, I know it. I know it. But it's not me. It's because I know who I am. I know what I am. I have a chance to get, I could have got offended with Scott today because we worked out what we were going to do. But that's not what I am. Who I am does, not what I am. I go to work and I do things above and aboard. That used to be hard for me because I'm doing it and no one else is doing it. Huh, if I had that dollar jar, I'd be broke. <laughs> but I'm not defined by that. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. If you get that, going out and laying hands on people, that's not something you do. That's what you are. Do you understand how scared Satan is? Because once you suddenly realize what sin is and what you are and what sin is subject to, you're free. Life goes from greatness to greatness better and better. And I tell you, I have so, the pastor asked me to come up. He said, I see you've got two testimonies. I'd like you to take. I didn't know what to. I mean, there are so many. There is really just so many. I can't even mention them. I'm not walking at this because I'm super Christian. I have great revelations now. All they got me were into trouble because what I knew. But now I know who I am. Everything changes. Now, the greatest excuse that's going to come to you is this. And this is a scripture in the Bible. It's very, very important. You need to know this. When the Lord shared this with me, it changed my life. None of you know enough of the word. Oh, you're done. Sorry. No, it doesn't work that way. You know, before us, generals came. Jesus went out and said, if you work in my field, I'll pay you a denarius. It's yours. And so they agreed to that. But he went out again. And he said, hey, come work in my field and I'll pay you what's right. The end of the world is coming. It's coming really fast. Now we can be Christians and we can be good people and come here on Sunday. It's not going to work. Or you can be who you were made to be. You can be the righteousness of God in Christ. You can take this world. I don't hear many amens. Are you awake? Do you want this or not? All right, do you want to lay hands on the sick and let them recover? Word of warning, don't look at what happens. Righteousness has been released. You know, when God sat down after He created the heavens and the earth, He sat down because He finished, but He didn't look to see what He'd done because He knew it was finished. That right is still going on. It hasn't changed. All right. Who's ready for some supernatural things to happen today? All right. Pray.
is, is James that was in the choir, are you here, James, still? James, come up here while, come, can you come up here, James? While, while he prays, James, I saw earlier the Holy Ghost, he, he's going to have, you got a song. You got a song from the Lord. I want you to close your eyes and come up here, and I just want you to move with God as he prays. I, my name is Jesus, my name is Jesus. I'm your healer, the one who died on the cross of Calvary. I said, when I was there, it is finished, all sin I destroyed just for you. My name is G Jesus. Don't you know I died to set you free? Who the sun set free? Oh, who the sun set free? I said, who the sun set free? It's free indeed. All you got to do is believe. All you have to do is believe, and you shall, you shall be set free. If you believe, you will receive. If you believe, you will be set free. Who the sun set free? Who the sun set free? Who the sun set free? It's free, 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 free. Indeed, my name is Jesus. My name is Jesus. I died. Oh, don't you know I died to set you free from every sickness. From every pain, from every disappointment, oh, 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 be set free, be set free, be 
set free right now be right right now be set free be free be free no more pain no more sickness will bother you ever again if you believe if you believe just receive receive your healing receive your healing receive your healing right now right now be set free 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 For who the sun set free is free, free indeed, indeed, indeed. My anointing, my anointing. Is setting you free. Receive, receive that anointing right now. Receive my anointing right now. Receive my anointing right now. Receive, 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 receive that anointing. Receive my anointing. Receive, 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 receive right now. Oh, don't doubt, just shout. Don't doubt, just shout. Don't doubt, shout the victory. Shout the victory. Shout the victory. Don't ever doubt, just shout. Shout the victory. You've been set free. You're being set free. You're being set free. You ought to start shouting right now. You ought to start shouting right now. Shout my name. Shout my name. Shout my name. You say Jesus. Jesus. Thank you for setting me free. Thank you for giving me the victory. Oh, thank you, Lord. Say thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for setting me free. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I'm free. I'm free. I'm free indeed. It's my day. This day is my day. I've been set free. I've been set free. I've been set free. Hallelujah. 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 Somebody shout hallelujah to the King of Kings, to the Lord of Lord. He's Alpha and Omega. He's the beginning and the end. Oh, Jesus.